Um, Karen is a retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who served tours in Alaska, Massachusetts, Spain, and Italy, and later served in communications and political military analysis at the National Security Agency and Pentagon. Since her retirement in 2003, she has spoken out against interventionist foreign policy and written numerous essays and articles, most of which are available at lewrockwell.com. She's been featured in several documentaries, including the award-winning Why We Fight. She was awarded the Sam Adams Award in 2018. She is a fellow of the Eisenhower Media Network and associated scholar of the Mises Institute. She holds advanced degrees from Harvard University, the University of Alaska, and a PhD from Catholic University in world politics. She and her husband of 41 years raised cattle and sheep in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. They have four children and nine grandchildren. Um, I want to say a word about um, her award, 2018 award, which was the Sam Adams Award uh, from Sam Adams Associates for Integrity in Intelligence. Um, uh, this, today, I was reading over her acceptance speech for that award, and I found it to be quite remarkable. And I really will recommend to everyone take an opportunity to read that. And I'll put a link to that uh, acceptance speech uh, in the chat. Uh, I did, however, want to quote just one paragraph. There's many paragraphs I want to quote, but I picked out one. Um, and uh, it, she said the following, it is in our country's interests as security professionals, as intelligence professionals, as soldiers and citizens, as writers and newsmakers, to be sensitive to the lawlessness, the immorality, and the wrongdoing of the bureaucracies and the leaders of the organizations we are a part of. That is the first thing we must cultivate and encourage, a sensitivity to and an awareness of something as simple as right and wrong. This is fundamental. From knowing right and wrong, we moved to the factor that motivates so many whistleblowers, something that we all share as human beings, and that is the idea of justice. So I can't recommend this uh, speech too highly, and I wanna turn things over to her. I'll, I'll say one other thing. I knew that she came from somewhat of a libertarian or, orientation. And I have my issues with libertarians, but I, I love to be able to discuss it. So I'm hoping to be able to discuss more with Karen on this. But I but I picked a topic which I thought, nah, she's not going to be interested. Uh, the topic was the freedom to have peace. What does this JFK speech tell us? Instead of rejecting it, she said, oh, marvelous. I want to do that. So I'm really excited to hear what, what Karen has to say. It's all yours. Yeah, well, well, thank you. Thank you for the uh, very kind introduction. And um, I'm hoping that the speech that I have here to, to kick things off um, will be satisfying in terms of the freedom to have peace. Um, I picked out things from his speech that I thought would fit. And then when you every time you watch the speech or read it, there's more that comes out at you. So hopefully if I'm not, uh, if I don't cover something that needs to be covered, we can definitely talk about it afterwards. But uh, here's, here's my reaction. John F. Kennedy wrote this speech and shared it with the world over 60 years ago. It is as fresh, pertinent, and shocking as it was when he first spoke these words. Given what we have been witnessing as America's current role around the world, the speech becomes both urgent and comforting because it lays out a map that we can use right now. Early on in the speech, he makes sure that we understand what peace really means. It is not a global rule under a dominant empire, nor is it a planet filled with nativists who reject technology and trade. He says, it is not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. 
He talks about the damage that war, including nuclear war, does not only to human life and economy, but to our precious air, water, and soil. He defines peace as the right to live out our lives without fear of devastation, the right to breathe air as nature provided it, the right of future generations to a healthy existence. As we listen again to his speech tonight, we might be reminded that our nuclear military forces, including an Ohio-class submarine, are converging on the Middle East and Southern Europe in an attempt to provide cover for a certain unpopular outbreak of violence in Gaza. This nuclear submarine, along with air, sea, and land forces, including a total of four carrier groups and special forces soldiers, are in place or will soon arrive in the theater, ready to wreak destruction at Washington's command. The Ohio-class subs were first deployed in 1981, a short genera generation after the assassination of JFK, and they represented an expansion of our nuclear triad, as we call it. Its existence is the result not of what JFK did, nor of what his predecessor Eisenhower did. But Ike recognized the seeds of a permanent warfare state and warned us of the deadly dangers it presented in language that perhaps wasn't as direct and as clear as it might have been. Eisenhower warned upon his exit from Washington that the military, technological, and industrial sector of the United States was growing rapidly in budget share, capability, and political influence. It was becoming the impetus for policy. Its interests were more influential in the design of our domestic and foreign policy, more influential than either the Constitution or the people. In reality, it appears that there was nothing Eisenhower could do about it, just like there was little that Kennedy could do about it. It also seems that there's nothing we today can do about this militant, destructive, booming sector of the U.S. economy and its locked in control of the U.S. government. That most of the stock of the defense industry is today owned by two major supranational investment firms, BlackRock and Vanguard, we can be forgiven if we feel powerless at times. It is almost as if we are not allowed to be free in our own country, to have peace, to enjoy peace, to make peace, to pursue peace. Not a single subsequent American president has believed as Ike and JFK. And while these two were members of different political parties and different generations, these two were the last of the American presidents with extensive personal experience in fighting and leading troops in the last war that formally declared by the US Congress, a legitimate war, if those two words can ever be used in the same sentence. Kennedy defined peace in terms that were down to earth and achievable, saying every thoughtful citizen should begin by looking inward, by examining his own attitude towards the possibilities of peace. He called on us to focus on a more practical, more attainable peace, based not on a sudden revolution in human nature, but on a gradual evolution in human institutions. He gives us the tools and uses terms like concrete actions and making peace seem and be more manageable and less remote. He states, our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. In the face of the uncontrollable, the impossible, the rage and temptation of war and force and grand global schemes, JFK speaks of the very tools that give each individual power to gain peace, to make peace, to even fight for peace. For these reasons and many more, his speech is liberating. President Kennedy expected each of us to do our part, to begin with introspection, to follow with understanding, and for all of us to take concrete steps to be people who can live and articulate and expand peace. Jesus told us to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies, but JFK recognizes that we will probably not love all of our neighbors, and he gives us more practical advice, and we have no excuse for not following it. I'll summarize his instruction briefly, as first to know ourselves and control our own thinking, and then work in ways accessible to us to live in peace, to build peace, and to create opportunities for peace. And as a people, ensure our government reflects who we are and conducts itself peacefully and puts peacefulness and self-determination and our natural human rights first and foremost over greed, alliances, ideology, habit, or the need to do something, anything with our massive military machine. Before I go on, I want to point out an aspect of his speech that seems perhaps obsolete, but in fact proves Kennedy both prescient and correct. This speech, a speech that many close observers believe was the real cause of the attempted assassination of JFK on November 2nd in Chicago, 
and the successful assassination on November 22nd in Dallas was given in the context of a nuclear superpower competition between the United States and the former Soviet Union. Pro-liberty and anti-communism rhetoric was a key part of the national dialogue, and the Pentagon led the way in determining how to win and survive a nuclear competition. Since that time, what we have seen in the world, at least with regard to the two former nuclear superpowers, is that while one of them continued apace with a nuclear offensive while paying lip service to concepts of liberty, the other one, the Soviet Union, collapsed its government under the bureaucratic weight of its empire, reducing its size, collecting and controlling its nuclear weapons, and moving in the direction of a global partner to many. Russia's stated goals for two decades now has been to fix its own house in a direction of liberty and prosperity and doing what Washington and Jefferson and Adams advised our country two centuries ago to avoid entangling alliances and to not go abroad seeking monsters to destroy. It is unlikely that Kennedy expected this for the Soviet Union that he knew, but this kind of progress in nations happens when several generations of people in those nations recognize that their government lies and stands on the shoulders of liars. Kennedy, in agreement with the better statesmen of the United States like George Cannon, as well as key Soviet counterparts, valued peace as a soldier and a statement values peace as the very best condition and the most worthy goal of a nation. There's another interesting aspect contained in this speech that perhaps Kennedy did not perceive in 1963. He laments the propaganda of the former Soviet state, and he could not believe that it could have merit. JFK laments that the Soviet allegation that American imperialist circles are preparing to unleash different types of wars, and that there is a very real threat of a preventative war being unleashed by American imperialists against the Soviet Union and that the political aims of American imperialists are to enslave economically and politically the European and other capitalist countries and to achieve world domination by means of aggressive wars. Today, we as students of our American government and 20th and 21st century history recognize that regardless of the motivation of the old Soviet propagandists, they too were very prescient. They too had some accuracy in how they perceived the United States and her directions and her motivations. There's so much to marvel at in this great speech. While JFK was speaking to the American people, the deep state and a burgeoning military industrial complex and to his Soviet counterpart and to the rest of the world, it is his message to Americans that liberty and peace go together that is most needed and most valuable today. Why do I say this? The deep state, the military industrial complex, the administrative American government, and its global and corporate counterparts in NATO and elsewhere is not listening to this speech, this message, or any modern spokesperson for this message of peace. War is their business. Theft of resources and controlling the globe is their business. A message of peace falls on the deaf ears of this empire of arms and influence. Like all empires, its failure to hear truth, to accurately self-assess, is the very seed of its own collapse. JFK's peace speech is not needed to be heard by the Russian president, heir to the collapsed Soviet empire. In fact, it sounds very similar to recent speeches of the Russian foreign minister Lavrov, of President Putin, and also of the Chinese chairman Xi Jinping, and many other leaders of the world. The message of peace, of cooperation, of national self-awareness and introspection, of the very real and serious responsibility that governments have to the lives and liberties of their people, this is a popular and meaningful message in many more places around the world today than it was in 1963. No, it is Americans today who most need JFK's message on peace and how it must be pursued. Who would have thought that his global listeners and, the Ameri and America's main opponent in 1963 would be the first to try and take steps toward peaceful coexistence with the rest of the world, and in doing so, provide their own people with the kind of liberty most had never known. In terms of liberty and peace, the United States has long lost its top position in several key peace and freedom indices, while those of our Cold War enemies have gained and even blossomed. Americans more than any other group need to awaken to JFK's message of solutions that man can create, of solutions that man can create to solve man-made problems. He knew, as we also know, conflict and war and threats of war and the machinery of war are all man-made problems. Because we're talking about JFK's peace speech from the 
from the perspective of a libertarian tonight. I'll share a few thoughts on war from the great libertarian and anarcho-capitalist Murray Rothbard. It is interesting to note that while written half a century ago, Rothbard's example here is sadly contemporary. In his 1973 book, For a New Liberty, a Libertarian Manifesto, he writes, and this is Murray Rothbard, let us assume for the moment a world of two hypothetical countries, Grassdark and Belgravia. Each is ruled by its own state. What happens if the government of Grassdark invades the territory of Belgravia? From the libertarian point of view, two evils immediately occur. First, the Grassdark army begins to slaughter innocent Belgravian citizens, persons who are not implicated in whatever crimes the Belgravian government might have committed. War then is mass murder, and this massive invasion of the right to life, of self-ownership, of numbers of people is not only a crime, but for the libertarian, the ultimate crime. Second, since all governments obtain their revenue from the thievery of coercive taxation, any mobilization and launching of troops inevitably involve an increase in tax coercion in Grassdark. For both reasons, because interstate wars inevitably involve both mass murder and an increase in tax coercion, the libertarian opposes war, period. I think that John F. Kennedy would agree in many ways with these libertarian sentiments. Most certainly, it was Kennedy's vision of a peaceful coexistence, a vision that included the ending of the Vietnam War, the ending of the funding of the CIA's global warmongering and assassination programs, and reigning in of the ability of the Federal Reserve to provide the US government with unlimited resources for illegal wars and interventions. These three goals that Rothbard and millions of other Americans would ha have supported then and now, these three goals I think maybe got him assassinated on November 22nd, 1963. Thank God we had him for a time and thank God he delivered this particular speech. His words have never been more needed, more pertinent or more important to the world. JFK is the only American presidential example of what choosing peace in troubled times can look like. Governments in this country before and after JFK's time have done everything they can to bury his message of peace and liberty just as they have promoted war and infringed upon American liberty in every way. But as Kennedy noted, these are man-made problems. And we, by assuming our God-given liberty and exhibiting even a fraction of the courage that JFA, JFK had, can and must solve them. And with that, I conclude and we can open for discussion. Thank you very, very much, 